Let's start back. Uh, the part three uh, of advanced diagnostic aids in periodontal therapy or periodontal diagnosis. Okay, so let's start here. So we've done the clinical and now the radiographic and now we come to the third part that's advanced microbiological aids. Now we have to understand uh, for sure that periodontal diagnosis, uh, rather periodontal disease is primarily caused by bacteria. Okay, and uh, unfortunately it's not a unibacterial condition it's a multibacterial condition. So unless I know which bacteria is causing the disease, I'm in no frame or in no position exactly to treat the disease. So we are like, we know now for sure that there's something called a specific, non-specific as well as an ecological plaque hypothesis. So depending upon the kind of hypothesis we're following, we do the interventions. Most of the treatments, even as of yet, are all based upon non-specific life hypothesis. That is, we are removing the entire plaque from the patient's mouth, you know, whether it's gingivitis or periodontitis. In doing so, we may actually be removing some of the beneficial bacteria, but we don't know which is beneficial, which is not. So that's why most of our diagnosed interventions are non-specific and in, in, uh, based on non-specific plaque hypothesis. On the other hand, uh, when you're looking at uh, uh, the study part, we're trying to figure out which particular bacteria is involved in causation of periodontal disease. Though uh, certain conditions like localized aggressive forms of periodontitis or generalized aggressive forms of periodontitis. We know that there are specific bacteria such as AA or epigingivalis that's involved, but there are other bacteria also. The other bacteria create an environment, then these bacteria come into picture and then they cause the disease to a higher degree of severity. That's what is the ecological plaque hypothesis. Now, how will I identify which bacteria is involved in causation of the disease? Because if I'm able to pinpoint that this is bacteria A, this is bacteria B that's causing the disease, then I, as a clinician, would direct my interventions to treating that particular bacteria. And that's very, very important. So and to understand uh, the various bacterial etiology and various bacteria, so we have now advances in microbiological analysis so that would include uh, bacterial culturing, dark field microscopy. These are very, very old. They've been done for years together, but the benchmark is still a bacterial culture because you know when you culture a bacteria, you know exactly what's activating or what's causing the disease. Uh, then you have the immunodiagnostic methods like direct and indirect immunofluorescence assays, the flow cytometries, uh, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay known as ELISA, and there is latex agglutination, there's BANA test, and there is a then you have the microbiological probes. Nowadays, uh, you are hearing a lot of this called RT-PCR that includes polymerized chain reaction, RT stands for real time. So we have various uh, advances in microbiological diagnosis, which we can use to identify the periopathogens and target our interventions at these particular bacteria. So let's see each of them in detail. Uh, bacterial culture is a gold standard and as of yet it still remains the benchmark against which every other microbiological tool is tested against. Okay, the biggest advantage is, for example, if I have a patient who's got a periodontal abscess with 3.6, I take a sterile curate, remove the plaque from that area, I send it for a culture, then I come to know which bacteria is involved, and then I target my antibiotic therapy against that particular anti, uh, against that particular bacteria, depending on the culture and sensitivity. I know that this condition would resolve for sure. On the other hand, <clears throat> the problem is it takes longer. Uh, for example, if I have taken a culture sample, if I take a sample today, it would take minimum amount of three to five days for the culture results to come out. So I am starting the patient on an empirical therapy, and then over a, after four to five days, then once I get the result, then I'll change my patient to very specific therapy. It's very good to identify the pathogen, but it is not very good when I'm looking at doing the clinical interventions. But yes, a culture and sensitivity would never fail anyone. So if the culture says bacteria AA is involved in LAP, it is always the AA, it can never go wrong. That's why it is known as a benchmarking or a gold standard when it comes to identifying the pathogens. The, uh, you know, you learned all of this in your third year, the selective and non-selective media, let's not go and redo it, uh, details of it. Uh, the next is a dark field microscopy, primarily involved, uh, is evaluated, uh, dark, dark field microscopy is primarily used in identifying spirochetes, okay, uh, and it was widely used when there was a lot of ANUG cases to identify whether uh, Bacteroid is Fossetus and Treponema denticola, the two uh, organisms that are highly involved in relation to uh, periodontal disease, especially in ANUG or necrotizing ulcerative periodontitis situations. But both of these are now uh, rarely followed. Okay, 
let's look at uh, dark field. Uh, yeah. uh, one of the uh, most biggest advantages uh, and changes in uh, microscopy right now, and which is the in thing right now, is something called as cone focal laser scanning microscopy. Okay, the biggest advantage of the, the cone focal laser uh, microscopy is that it will exactly tell us which bacteria is involved. We know that every object, every object uh, in the universe absorbs light of a certain wavelength and gives out light of a certain wavelength. Now, for using the same principle, what they've done was they used fluorescent dyes. Okay, they used dyes or you can even do it without the dyes. So, what they did was they took a plaque sample and they subjected it to a they subjected to what we call a laser beam and then observed it on the screen on the microscope. Now, which bacteria emitted which radiation out? You can identify what is the bacteria that's involved. So, what are the different types of bacteria that are present in this particular plaque sample? And that's the biggest advantage. Second, the second thing was it is fast because I take the sample, I put it on the microscope in the lab next door, and I'm seeing it. The biggest problem, it's expensive. Okay. So the next part was, uh, okay, identifying the bacteria is tougher or it either takes longer or it's very expensive. The next thing was, uh, is there something else that we can do? Now, uh, you all have, uh, in the COVID era, now all of us and all of you have been very, uh, uh, what we call, heard this term called rapid antibody testing. Now, what is an antibody testing? Antibody testing is nothing but evaluating the body's response to a particular uh, antigen. Now, uh, in we as clinicians or microbiologists or anyone, immunologists, can identify two things. Either you can identify the antigen or you can identify the antibody. Antigen is something that's invading and the antibody is something that is the body's response to this invading organism. Now, what we're looking at in an immunodiagnostic method, very, very simple. I can use tools by which I can identify the antigen, for example, by direct microscopy or immunofluorescence or latex agglutination. I can even identify the antibody. If I'm able to find the antibody, then I can tell you what antigen is. If I can find the antigen, I will know that what antibody is going to work along with it. So that's how uh, the immunodiagnostic methods came into picture. The most common include indirect and direct immunofluorescence uh, assays, the versions of microscopy. Uh, there is something called a flow cytometry, ELISA, uh, membrane assay, and then latex agglutinin. Let's see one by one. Immunofluorescence assay. Uh, what does immunofluorescence do? Now, uh, every bacteria can take up a stain. For example, that's what you did when you did your gram staining, uh, et cetera, when you did your microbiology, if you remember. Okay, so what you did, you took a sample, you put the stain, you washed it, and then you washed it under the microscope. So what looked blue looked one, what didn't take up the blue or the pink, it's something else, so it's very simple. Exactly in similar manner, what we do now is uh, we use a dye. The primarily used dye is fluorescent isothiocyanate, uh, which is blue which gives out a blue or a green light. If you're using an acromine dye, it would be yellow color light, and if you use rhodamine, it's orange or red, okay? So what you do now is I take the plaque sample, I put it on a slide, okay? On that slide, what I'll do now is I take an antibody. For example, I am considering that this plaque sample may contain A, so I'll take an antibody with uh, antibody to the A, which is already made in the lab, which is already ready. Uh, Okay, and then this antibody is coated with a fluorescent dye. Now, if the antigen and antibody reaction happens, if antigen and antibody, so for example, the plaque has A and this antibody, which I have with this fluorescent dye, which is attached to it, is there. The minute if they meet, and then what will happen, the dye will light up. So when I see it under the microscope, the dye will look fluorescent. So then I can tell you, yes, this uh, plaque sample on the slide contains A. If it doesn't light up, then obviously it doesn't mean that there is no A in this particular plaque sample. So that's a direct immunofluorescence. The other one uh, to detect is you use two antibodies. So for example, now what I do, uh, it's, uh, using this two antibody technique is also known as indirect immunofluorescence. So for example, now I have a plaque sample, which I suspect has AA. So I take this plaque sample, which contains AA, then I'll put the antibody to AA properly. So what happens now, I have the AA on the slide, then anti-AA antibody is there. So Eventually, that would have reacted, okay? And then what I'll do now is, I take one more antibody, which is the antibody to the first antibody, okay? It's an anti -A antibody to the first antibody, which has got a fluorescence. So now what happens? I use a second antibody, and then if the second antibody to the first antibody meets, and if it colors, then I know that it is AA. If it is, doesn't, 
give out the fluorescence, then it means it doesn't have the AA. So what I'm doing in the direct, I'm directly hitting the bacteria and trying to figure out whether it is there in the direct immunofluorescence. Whereas with the indirect immunofluorescence, what I'm doing, I'm detecting the antibody to the antigen. Okay, either way, what you'll detect is whether there is this particular bacteria which is present or this particular bacteria which is not there. Okay, following the same principles, uh, okay, uh, uh, okay, you don't need to go through these details. It's not important. Following the same principles, we have now what we call as the uh, latex agglutination. Okay, latex agglutination uh, is exactly following the same uh, principle. So, what we do now, instead of uh, the fluorescence, you have a latex bead. Okay, so what we do now, you take a latex bead and then you have the antibody to the, uh, this one. So uh, antibody is bonded to the latex bead and which is kept. Now I take the back plaque sample, that's bacterial sample from the mouth. And then I add this latex containing antigen, antibody containing latex granules. So it's like, for example, you have, uh, uh, what you say, marbles. You take uh, marbles or ping pong balls, which have got glue all around it. So this glue is like an antibody. The ping pong ball is coated with this glue. And now if the bacteria, what I'm using, have a similar glue or a well, or you can say, instead of a well, uh, glue, you can say well velcro strip. So I take, uh, uh, what do I say? I take these uh, mob, uh, latex granules and I coat the latex granule with the velcro strip, only one part of the velcro strip. Okay. Then I take the bacteria which is collected from the plaque sample and then the, I mix both of them. And as I mix both of them, if the bacteria have the other part of the Velcro and they meet each other, all the uh, latex granules will fuse together. And this agglutination process is known as a latex agglutination. So you take a latex, which is coated with an antibody, and then you put the bacterial sample. If the bacteria have, are mating with the same anti antibody, what is there, coated onto the latex granules, then they agglutinate. It. And this is known as latex agglutinate. It's exactly similar to immunofluorescence. So instead of using the fluorescent dye, you use the latex. There's nothing more difference apart from that. The other parts uh, of uh, uh, understanding the microbiological part would be something called a flow cytometry. Okay, now uh, what is flow cytometry? It's again a technique where you're identifying a particular bacteria. So what is done in a flow cytometry is very, very simple. So what we do now is, uh, uh, you take a plaque sample from the mouth. You know, when you have a plaque sample collected after scaling, you know, it's a clump. So what has to be done is this clump is converted to single cell suspension. So what they do is you take the plaque sample using the curette, uh, you suspend it in saline or whatever solution, you thin it down, and then you convert it. To, imagine such a big, uh, small uh, plaque sample clump is converted to each and every bacterial cell. So, and this bacterial cell is then put through a linear flow. So, for example, uh, I am using a lens and then I have a linear cell flow. I have one one cell that is coming now, uh, dropping in front of this lens and I'm observing it. So, what happens? I see each and every cell coming through the plaque sample and then I can identify which particular bacteria is there in that. And that's what is known as flow cytometry. Uh, it was modified by using a uh, dye and that's why it is known as what you call a uh, cytofluorography in the sense you add a dye to the cells. So the cells which take up the same dye will exactly come in the same manner. Then the cells which take up a higher or a lower version of the dye, then they look different under the uh, lens of the microscope. So that's what is a flow cytometry. So what happens? You take the bacterial sample clump, you convert it to single suspension, you drop them and each and every cell as it flows through the cytometer is red. It is not red physically like this, what I'm telling. It's red in a cell reader. And then the cell reader will tell you, okay, uh, this plaque sample had 20 AA, 30 P. gingivalis, 40, this one. So is it exactly the number of a particular organism which is collected from that particular plaque sample? And then you can tell, you, uh, tell us which bacteria are involved in the uh, plaque in that particular. So for example, if I have a tooth, which is an abscess, I take the plaque from there and then I convert it to single cell suspensions and read it. The cells which are highest in number, for example, uh, out of 5,000 cells which the cell counter would count, uh, if I say that, okay, there were 3,000 AA, then I would say AA is the primary cause for disease in that particular site. That's what uh, would be a flow cytometry tell you. Apart from that, uh, you also have uh, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or also known as ELISA, uh, is very, very popular uh, testing kit. ELISA is primarily a benchmarking tool against, with especially uh, uh, 
antibodies uh, and antigens of a of hiv and hepatitis are tested it's probably the most go to testing when you want to test very specifically what uh, DC, uh, what organisms or antibodies to which organism are present in the human body again the principle is very simple antigen and antibody reaction okay now uh, what is done here is very simple so you take an enzyme substrate you take the enzyme substrate and you coat that and uh, enzyme substrate with the immunoglobulin so it's exactly very similar to your latex agglutination so what happens is you have the enzyme and then you have the immunoglobulin and then you add the patient's serum antibody for example now i want to test whether my patient has got uh, uh, what you call antigens to aa so what i'll do now instead of taking a plaque sample and testing it out i'm taking the blood i'm taking of the serum and then i'm injecting the serum or mixing that serum with the enzyme substrate okay and as i put it into this then if there is an antigen antibody reaction happening and i can read it under the microscope then i'll tell you whether the patient has patient serum has antibodies to this particular antigen okay elisa basically tests antibodies and not antigens whereas the immunofluorescence etc can be used to test both antigen as well as the antibody okay so what i'll do now is i have an enzyme substrate uh, just to recollect i have an enzyme substrate then i take the uh, which this enzyme substrate is added to a immunoglobulin so it's basically a carrier and then i mix the patient's blood with that and then i see if they both are reacting it means the antibody or immunoglobulin what i've used is exactly matching what is in the patient so then that's what you will see the reaction as okay so what is done here is when this reaction happens you know enzymes react so as and when the enzyme reaction happens you get the color out and that's what is red membrane immunoassay is exactly similar to elisa okay uh, there is a chemical uh, there is a commercially available kit known as evalucite uh, which is used for uh, uh, membrane immunoassay uh, this is a chair side kit so for example what we are doing now here in this evalucite chair side kit is it is used to test a pg and pg uh, pivotal intermedia what is done very very simple it's a chase side kit it's like your glucometer you know it's like you take a drop of blood you put the blood and then how you say what is sugar level exactly in similar manner this chair side kit is available and then what you do is you take the plaque sample from the patient's mouth you clean it up your and then you mix a plaque sample in this kit and then you say what color change happens if the uh, color change happens you will come to know that they all, you have to understand all these kits have a dye because that when you can read whether the antigen and antibody reaction has taken place and this uh, this dye would then tell you exactly the kit uh, whether a pg or pg or pivotal intermediate are there in the kit so we just covered this okay so now uh, this is about the various immunodiagnostic please understand uh, any immunodiagnostic kit will help you identify to summarize this it will help you identify whether you have an antigen or you have an antibody now whether it's an antigen or an antibody their counters are tested either using a dye or a latex or uh, an enzyme uh, enzyme dye or latex are basically the tools okay and then you read if it's a dye it will give a color if it's an enzyme if it broken down then it gives one more color if it's a latex if you will have a clumping it's as simple as that okay so all these three, whether it's elisa immunofluorescence or latex agglutination they all tell you depending upon uh, the antigen or the antibody reaction that's taking place okay uh, this is a very very important uh, thing what you all have to remember please understand it's known as bana test okay uh, now we have to understand that certain enzymes are certain are very very specific uh, every uh, uh, every living cell every living cell every bacteria everything have very specific enzymes now what's happening here is three uh, bacteria especially known as bacteroides forciflorus for a porphyrin monos gingivalis some small spirochetes and treponema denticola and capnocyte forga these four species of bacteria they release an enzyme called as a trypsin like protease or a trypsin like enzyme okay now uh, this trypsin like enzyme works uh, uh, on something called a bana now let's understand what this does so if these four bacteria are present they contain a trypsin like enzyme so if i'm able to test the trypsin like enzyme if i'm able to test what is if if i can be able to identify rather that 
the presence of trypsin like enzyme is there then i can tell you that in this particular plaque sample either of these four bacteria are present i hope you understand what i'm telling so if i detect trypsin like enzyme in a plaque sample then i can tell either b phosphorylus p ginger virus Treponema denticola and Capnocytophaga are present or not in this particular plaque sample. Okay, and that tool to test that is known as a Barna test. It tests for something called as a black pigmented bacteroides. So now what is done is uh, the substrate, uh, the activity of this enzyme uh, is measured by hydrolysis of this substrate. What is the substrate? N-benzoyl D-L-arginine 2 naphthalamide. Please remember this N-benzoyl D-L-arginine. Two naphthalamoid, also known as Bana. So now, what happens is when I take a plaque sample and I mix with this Bana, okay, and then this Bana, if it is broken down, the Bana is broken down into benzoyl and arginine naphthalamide. And this naphthalamide, when it gets broken down, it gets releases an orange red color, okay. Uh, and this is what is identified, okay. So what I'm doing now is I take a plaque sample, uh, I add Bana to it, and then uh, once I mix it with mana, then I add a small drop of fast garnet. And then if I see an orange red color, then it means that either of those bacteria are present. If I don't get that orange red color, then none of those four bacteria are present. So mana is a very good test to identify periopathogens, especially what we call as the black pigmented bacteroides. There is a commercial kit uh, based on the mana test. It's known as Periscan. Evalucitos 1 kit. This is one more kit known as Periscan. It's a chair side kit again, just like your glucometer again. So what I do, I take a plaque sample, I put it on the Bana test, and then this uh, I put it uh, once I collect it, then I put it in water, and then you check, and then you see a change in the color. If the color changes changes to a pale blue, then it means that it is a two test. It means that any of those four black pigmented bacteroides are present in the plaque sample of this particular patient or particular tooth from where you've taken it. Okay, so uh, that concludes the uh, antigen antibody testing. Uh, next, we move on to one of the most exciting parts of uh, diagnosis, and that's what we call as the nucleic acid probes. Please understand, please understand, the word nucleic acid probe, probe here, is not a probe in a physical form. It's not a perio probe like a metal probe or a plastic probe or a Florida probe, no. Nucleic acid probes here, the word probe means an investigation. It's like a CBI probe, okay? It's like an investigation. So nucleic acid probe, the word probe here means that I am investigating something. I'm investigating something, okay? So what I'm investigating here is I'm investigating the antigen. I'm investigating the antigen. Now, what is this? Every nucleic acid probe, that whether it's a DNA probe, whether, whether it's a DNA, whether it's a DNA probe, whether it's a RNA probe, whether it's a polymerase chain reaction, or RT-PCR, or uh, restriction endonuclease analysis, any of these nucleic acid probes are based on very, very simple hypothesis. What it means? It's very simple. We have to understand that there is something called a base pairing rule. What is the base pairing rule? AT, GC, AU, GC means adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. So all the nucleic acid probes, whatever we use based on this. So if I have a probe which contains a certain sequence and I take that and then mix with the opposite strand. So because you have to understand they're all double, double stranded. DNA is double stranded, RNA is single stranded. Now when we have these stranded uh, pairs, if I, if I separate them, they are known as base pairs. Now, if I have adenine here and if I have thymine only, then they would meet. They, it would not meet with anything else. So if I have a gene sequence on one probe and in the laboratory, and if I have a plaque sample which I've taken out from the patient and I converted that into single strand, and then I mix this single strand what I've taken from the plaque to this what I have already have in the library, and if they meet, then it means that this DNA strand, for example, these are DNA strand in the library of AA, and this is a plaque sample. So if they both pair each other, then I'll come to know that, yes, there was AA which was present in this particular patient. It's exactly the same principle on which, whether it's a DNA probe, whether it's an RNA probe, or a polymerase chain reaction, all of them work. The DNA probe, uh, when I be use the word DNA probe, the DNA probe includes a full genome. For example, if I have a bacteria which has uh, 300 uh, base pair DNA sequence, then I am separating out the entire gene and testing the entire full bacteria. 
on the other hand if i am using the rna probe then i am using the rna of that particular bacteria rna is much more easier okay on the other hand if i am doing uh, uh, what we call a pcr they will come to that a bit more later now a dna probe technology the conventional dna probe that's a full gene then there is something called a checkerboard checkerboard is very very simple it's for example uh, if i have 300 different bacteria and i have 300 different dna sequences they are all put on a well for example it's like a keyboard of a laptop or a computer so each uh, button is a well and on each well i have a dna probe or a dna sequence single strand dna which is laid out and then i take the plaque sample and i'll put it into each well there and then which all wells turn out positive they will give this color the way you see here on the screen here okay and so and then based upon that i'll come to which all bacteria are present and that's what i would read so it helps in identifying multiple bacteria in a very very short period of time that's the biggest advantage of what we call a dna dna checkerboard hybridization it's like a checkerboard okay uh, again, uh, there's one more, uh, the nucleic acid flow, apart from the DNA and RNA is known as the restriction endonuclease analysis. Now we have to understand, again, the principle is the same. The endonuclease is an enzyme. What this endonuclease enzyme does, it cleaves the DNA fragment. The job of the endonuclease is to cleave the DNA fragment. Now, for the restriction endonuclease, for every DNA fragment, there's a specific endonuclease. Now, for example, AA, there's an AA, the restriction endonuclease uh, enzyme for AA is very specific. This restriction endonuclease enzyme of AA will not work for PG. It can work only for AA. So now, instead of identifying the DNA, if I'm able to identify the enzyme, then it's very, very simple. So what they're done is, instead of taking the plant sample, separating the entire DNA and then testing, it's more easier. Identifying an enzyme is much more easier. So what they did was, they understand, they understood that, it's much more easier to identify the endonuclease enzyme. So that's what they did. So instead of a DNA, they started testing for the enzyme that breaks down this DNA. And that's what is called as a restriction endonuclease analysis. Okay. <clears throat> Apart from that, nowadays, the most common, most common and highly popular is what we call as the polymerase chain reaction. Now, what's the biggest advantage of polymerase chain reaction? You can do multiple testing. Okay. Uh, and it's much more easier okay so what we do now is uh, how it is done uh, the advantage being you can test large quantities of dna so if i have full mouth plaque or multiple patients plaque or if i have a pooled plaque or a full mouth plaque then what i'll do i want to test the entire plaque for patient so what this does is you can amplify it out so pcr begins with isolation of dna first you take the isolation of a dna then this dna is broken into specific parts now we have to understand uh, every specific part of a dna now i if you see on the top line it's full standard dna which is broken down into two then it's further broken down into small small parts and each small part can be used to analyze so now what happens is if i have to analyze the entire dna it's going to take me probably five days if i have to do a smaller section probably will take three days but on the other end if i have to just analyze a very small fragment especially in the small part down there I'm getting it done in two minutes. And that's the biggest advantage of what we call as the RT-PCR. The test, you know, uh, for the COVID right now, they say it takes around three days for testing. Three days is taking us only to break down the entire DNA fragment into two parts. Actually, testing would be two minutes. So once I have broken, once I have this small three to five section here, the minute I put it under the well, I get exactly what we call as a test whether the COVID is present or not. Exactly in a similar manner, we can test whether the particular bacteria is present and the mouth or not. That's what, that's why what we do now is known as what we call as the real-time PCR or what we call the RT PCR, real-time reverse transcript PCR. So that's it about uh, what we call as the microbiological testing uh, for periodontal pathogens. Uh, it starts with what we call, let's go back to the slides here. Let's just go back and test what are the various uh, bacterial tests, which all how we identify the bacteria involved in periodontal diseases. It starts here with culturing is the most basic. Everything else is compared. So culturing is still the gold standard. Then you have the dark field or face contrast microscopy. You have direct immunofluorescence and indirect immunofluorescence assay, flow cytometer, 
may free uh, enzyme like immunosorbent assay, latex agglutination. Then you also have what you call as a BANA test. Please remember BANA, very, very important from the exam perspective. Uh, then you have the nucleic acid probes. Please understand the probe here. I insist on you to remember that the probe here is an investigation and not a physical probe in the form of a metal probe. It is not a metal or a plastic probe. It's a physical investigation. So you have a DNA probe, RNA probe, restriction endonuclease, and polymerase. DNA probe is a full genome of the bacteria analyzed. Restriction endonuclease is you're in analyzing or identifying whether this particular endonuclease enzyme is present. In a polymerase chain reaction, you identify small segments of the DNA in a reverse transcriptase manner. And that's what we're looking at in the microbiological diagnosis of uh, periodontal pathogens. I'll just jump out now and then come to the last part is what we call as understanding or evaluating the host enzymes okay now uh, we have to understand uh, that we told there is an antigen there's an antibody uh, there's an antibody reaction and then that's what we're identifying apart from that in the periodontal tissues in the oral cavity in the periodontal tissues there is something called a host response to the bacteria and now by identifying the host response you can also identify what bacteria are present or what's happening in the tissues because when i identify a bacteria i can identify what is causing the problem now i want to know how my tissue is reacting for example whether it's inflaming but it's not inflaming whether the collagen is getting broken down whether the collagen is getting reconstructed whether the bone is forming or bone is getting lost so for that reason what we are now trying to figure out is let us identify what is the host reaction that's happening? And that's what we are looking at in what we call identifying the host products of the periodontal disease process. Now, why is it important to identify the host products is simple. Periodontal disease is a disease caused by the bacteria, but the outcomes are depending upon how the host reacts to the bacteria. If the host reacts very aggressively, then the disease gets localized to gingivitis only. If the disease, if the host response is very, very poor, then it can suddenly become very aggressive form of a periodontitis. If the host response and bacterial virulence are at a balance, then it can be gingivitis uh, or it can go into chronic periodontitis. So how do we analyze the host response is very, very important. And that's what we're going to study now uh, in the last section of advanced uh, diagnostic aids. Okay, so what are the things we can test here? We can test inflammatory mediators, we can test host derived enzymes, we can test tissue breakdown products. Okay, so most of these host broke down products are tested from GCF. We all know that GCF is a product which is coming out from the periodontal tissues into the crevice. This GCF can be collected and then tested for various things. Okay. So what we're testing, we're testing uh, the leukocytes, we can test the products of the leukocytes, you can test collagen and everything. So let's see. Okay, so now the easiest way to analyze uh, host products is GCF. Uh, you, you already covered this in your GCF sample, so let's not go into it. But uh, for the sake of completion, if there is an increase in the GCF flow, it tells that there is an inflammatory process that's happening there. So the easiest way to understand or identify inflammatory process uh, is by using an instrument known as periotron. Okay, you use uh, paper strips, you put it in the gingival device, and then you put it into this equipment known as periotron, and it will tell you exactly how much of volume of fluid is collected. And that will tell you, you know, what's the condition. You can also use dyes, uh, like ninhydrin dyes, and check whether there's a lot of protein in the fluid. It means that there's a lot of exudative reaction that's happening if there's a lot of protein. Uh, so that's what you can do with GCF. Okay, uh, so what are, apart from those, we can identify what we call as various antibodies also in GCF, that is how the host is reaction. So let's look at this. Uh, there's an entire list of products, what you can identify. It starts with, uh, uh, yeah, let's, uh, yeah. We can identify host response markers, including prostaglandin E2, interleukin 1, 2. So various, please, um, if you want, I would recommend you to make a note of this uh, on your notes. Uh, we can identify something called a tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin L, uh, 1 alpha, beta, interleukin 6, interleukin 8, PGT. Anything that is broken down in the host can be evaluated. And anything that is pro inflammatory, anything that can cause inflammation, will indicate if higher numbers of PG2 or higher amount of interleukin 1 alpha tells that this tissue is undergoing higher degree of inflammatory uh, reaction and higher amount of tissue destruction. Okay? Uh, 
apart from that uh, <clears throat> yeah so apart from that you also have something called host derived enzymes we can analyze uh, which includes matrix metalloprotein nothing but collagenases different forms of collagenases can be used okay yeah this is entire list please remember this uh, entire list so what are the various host derived enzymes that can be tested from gcf collagenases elastase catepsin gb and d or uh, dipeptide peptase tryptase uh, hyaluronidase beta glucuronidase al acid and alkaline phosphatase so if you're able to identify acid and alkaline phosphatase you can tell very clearly that is a lot of bone breaking down acid phosphatase increases increases bone being broken down alkaline phosphatase higher levels in kids include uh, indicate that this bone is getting formed so you can identify all these products in the gcf for the patient and then tell whether there is a tissue breakdown happening or tissue reconstruction that's happening okay uh, apart from that you can also identify collagenases uh, and various other bacteria so what's important here uh, for us is just remember at undergraduate level uh, is this there are various host derived products which are present in the gingival crevice and these gingival crevice products can be evaluated and they will indicate whether there's a presence of inflammation or for example the most important ones would i would recommend you to remember would be collagenases bacterial as well as host derived acid phosphatase indicates higher acid phosphatase in the bone breakdown alkaline phosphatase in the bone the uh, reconstruction okay so this is just uh, for you to complete uh, the entire list you can go through this each of them but uh, from an undergraduate perspective i just request you to remember those uh, lists and that would uh, be sufficient enough for you to understand uh, what are the various uh, various various forms of uh, this one yeah apart from uh, host derived enzyme there are a few things what you have to remember this is something called as tissue degradation products so enzymes are one and then tissue degradation products primarily a uh, four uh, please remember these four five terms number one is fibronectin if you have fibronectin in the gcf then it indicates that there is a collagen breakdown and tissue breakdown happening if there's hydroxyproline which you're collecting uh, if there's a when you do a test for hydroxyproline and you find higher, higher hydroxyproline it means that there is tissue break uh, reconstruction happening if you find uh, two uh, three important protein four important proteins from bone that is osteonectin osteocalcin bone phosphoprotein and uh, <clears throat> uh, dip and uh, uh, and bone siloprotein four proteins osteonectin osteocalcin bone siloprotein okay and osteocalcin these are the four bone proteins if your patient's gcf shows any of these four bone proteins then it means that there is bone that is actually getting broken down it indicates that there is bone loss that's happening in your patient at that particular point in time so this indicates tissue degradation is happening so if i have a patient i take a gcf sample from this patient and i test for these bone proteins and i find any of these protein levels are higher it means that there is tissue breakdown bone breaking down that's happening okay apart from that uh, you also have soft tissue breakdown products uh, especially hydroxyproline glycosaminoglycans so anything that is broken down in the human body can be analyzed and this analysis uh, will help us identifying what's happening in the patient's uh, mouth you can even identify glucose uh, for example if you take a gcf uh, glucose and then test it you can tell whether actually the patient is uh, what you call diabetic or no so uh, that's what uh, is all about the various uh, diagnostic features so let's just go back and conclude this chapter okay i'll just go back to the slide the first one here right up here yeah. so what are the very uh, what do you mean by advances in clinical diagnosis advances in clinical diagnosis or advances in prenatal diagnosis means that the various tools that we have at our disposal to identify the prenatal disease uh, identify it, whether it's happening before whether it's happening uh, right now whether it's what or what's going to happen in the future so we can identify all of these things now these are divided into various factors one would be clinical diagnosis which includes various probes it includes microbiological diagnosis which includes the assessment of various bacteria it includes host derived uh, factors assessment of various enzymes and it also primarily includes radiographic parameters various radiographic tools to identify what's happening in the tissue level so based upon these various parameters and various factors we can tell whether the disease is happening whether it is stable whether it's not going to happen or how will be the response of the disease to any kind of clinical intervention 
So uh, I think I would conclude the class now. Uh, all these slides are there for you to see. Uh, you can access them anytime. They're on the channel there on Google Classrooms or also on my YouTube channel. You can access it there and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you so much. Uh, till we meet again. Thank you. Uh, stay safe, uh, stay at home and till we meet again. Best wishes kids, do well. Thank you.